Um, my name is Mandy Stewart from the British Library um, and uh, I'm very pleased to be here today to talk to you. Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, why we decided to um, adopt Primo and um, some of the uh, things we encountered during our implementation, some of the ways we approached it, uh, something about the data that we now have available through our Primo um, and some uh, current developments that are going on um, with our Primo. So first of all, just a little bit about the British Library. Uh, it is the National Library of the UK and uh, is a, a world-class cultural and intellectual resource serving the needs of today's researchers. This is one of our kind of <coughs> slogans on our website. Uh, but it is also the custodian of the UK's written and spoken heritage, uh, which means that we are, have for a very long time been collecting um, the output of UK publishers in the print world and we have from April this year had a legal obligation to also collect the output of the digital world. So our collections are massive. Uh, we have over 150 million items, there's really too many to count in all sorts of different um, types of, of media, um, both, again, both physical and digital now. And um, using our online catalogue, our Primo, um, we have around 6 million searches every year, and we have around 400,000 people visiting our reading rooms on an annual basis. So, um, what, why, why we decided to do Primo, I'll give you some more details in a moment, but basically um, we are supporting our strategic priorities in relation to access to our collections. And I just thought it would be useful to put up. So these are our current strategic priorities which um, kind of underlie why we um, go in the directions that we go. So we want to guarantee access to our collections for future generations, which obviously implies uh, preservation. Um, we also um, want to enable access to everyone who wants to do research. So we are constantly looking at um, ways in which researchers are working and, and trying to keep up with, with new developments in that area. Um, we also, because we are the National Library and we are government funded, um, need to ensure that we are providing an economic benefit with what we do. Um, but we also have um, a public good role in enriching the cultural life of the nation. Um, so, really fundamentally we want to lead within the UK um, our, our knowledge base, the world knowledge base, and collaborate as well in order to um, keep the developments going. So, we actually began our implementation of Primo back in 2008, so I thought it would be useful to look at what the um, driving strategic priority then was. Um, and just to read this to you, uh, we need to look beyond the traditional library catalogue, exposing our collection to wider audiences and taking account of the interests of rights holders, allowing users to shape and personalise their research and connecting users with content, content with content and ultimately users with other users. <coughs> so uh, I think what that's saying is that um, what we had at that time was not fulfilling those requirements, so we needed to look for a new way of providing access to our users. Um, so we were looking forward to the next generation of discovery and access services, and we wanted to think about what users actually wanted. So they wanted larger aggregations of data, bringing together many um, disparate catalogues that we had with a single point of discovery. And we wanted to integrate our delivery and access services, which we didn't have at that time. Um, and we also wanted, and this was kind of a newly developing um, idea at that time, we wanted able, people to be able to interact with our content, build the web to approach. So why did we choose Primo? Um, we saw Primo as being a first step towards these goals that, were, that we had identified. Um, and 
it was really, at that time, the first on the market to offer the functionality that we felt we needed for our new core services. Scalability is extremely <coughs> important to us because we have such large collections and also a um, very varied, wide range of, of different types of collections. But I think, as has been mentioned, we also um, do find it extremely useful um, that for ex libris products there is a community of users who do collaborate and uh, communicate um, uh, to a large amount and we, we find that very beneficial in that you know, there are mailing lists, there are, there are user groups, there are conferences or where you are able to meet with other customers with the same products but also have the opportunity to talk to ex libris staff and that's very valuable to us. Um, we wanted at that time particularly to start trying out new ways of um, discovery, but specifically for digital content which we were increasingly taking in and obviously are, are on a much larger scale now. And we had been Aleph users since 2002, so we had worked quite extensively with Ex Libris and we felt that they did know quite a lot about um, the British Library's needs which do tend to vary from the kind of standard university requirements. So we decided to go with Prima. And um, one of the things we did, we, we bought Primo, uh, we set it up on test systems, and then we sought to find out what our users would think about it. Would they like it? Would they use it? So we had a group of postgraduate students from uh, University College London, which is very close to um, the British Library. <coughs> and we got them to just come in and have a look and give us some thoughts about uh, was it something that they would use? Um, this was the, the time when um, there had been surveys done, particularly on students, that said students never use library catalogues, they Google everything. So was this something that would you know, stop them using Google and come to us? Um, we also talked to our reading room customers. Um, I think somebody asked a question or, or made a comment earlier about the difference between your staff and your students' requirements. We have a huge and varied range of customers from those who don't really like the whole concept of things being online and would be much happier reading a book and not having to um, engage with, with technology <coughs> to people who are you know, very savvy uh, technologically and want the latest thing immediately. And somehow we have to try and satisfy all those requirements. Uh, it's not an easy task. And uh, we have also quite a vociferous um, uh, clientele who, if they don't like what we're doing, are very quick to um, write to the newspapers or write to our chief executive to tell them they don't like what we're doing. So we, we do have to uh, try to gauge reaction from our, our customers. We also, having, having set up the, uh, the prototype, if you like, um, did employ a specialist testing laboratory where um, try to capture the illustration, you can employ a, a laboratory to uh, interview people um, and get them to look at your system and comment on it and ask them questions whilst you're watching through a, a, um, a window that, where they can't see you and it's an interesting <coughs> experience in the uh, quite unexpected behaviour of, of some of the people in, in that uh, situation. So, um, the way that we planned, planned Primo, and I think this is probably um, a much more, a wider experience now, but um, instead of going to the, the kind of standard way of planning a project of having it all very laid out, um, we knew that there were going to be um, a lot more uh, frequent releases of the software, um, similar to the, the Alma approach now. So, we needed to plan for a much more iterative process. Um, and that, that gelled with what we wanted to do because we wanted to build up the number of data sets that we um, accessed through Primo, that we harvested into Primo. Um, we also wanted to take advantage of new functionality that was coming out with, with the releases, um, and in particular the, the Web2 capabilities which were changing um, quite rapidly. So the project was planned as a kind of permanent beta or a continuous improvement project. 
which was quite a new concept for our project management staff at the time um, and was not, not always um, approved of. So, um, we now have around 63 million records harvested into our FEMO. Um, this is just a list of the different sources. I've got a couple of, of slides coming up that show you um, how this supports the, the data and the services. Um, but these, uh, I used to put numbers on these, but they, they're growing all the time. So, I, and rather than keep updating the numbers, I've just given you a list of all the different sources. But these are, for those of you who know about the, the, the way Primo works, these are the pipes that feed into Primo. So, this is a little picture. So, this is, these are the source catalogues. So, the ILS catalogue is ALEF. Um, the others listed underneath are all from different systems. Um, these are the material types that we have available through our Primo. And these are how they join up. So, um, as you can see, Aleph is a major source of many different types of, of material, but we do have quite a lot of other sources as well. And this next slide is the same, shows you the same source catalogues feeding into Primo, but this is how it supports our delivery systems. So we have, obviously we have breeding rooms, um, we have um, remote supply, those are our two kind of major uh, customer services, um, and then there are all these other um, receivers of, of the data. And we are still looking to kind of refine that. Um, it's an ongoing project, really. So, um, having implemented Primo, Explore the British Library, as it's called, um, we um, had had it running in parallel in our, for our customers for about three years. So we decided <coughs> we would take the plunge and switch off the old OPAC, the Aleph OPAC. Um, so we did, we, we spent about six months um, advertising the fact this was going to happen. It was available for people to look at and use already. Um, and we did uh, lots of communications, we did training of staff, we had special drop-in sessions for our customers. And then in January 2012, we switched off the RFO pack. And still, everybody went, oh, you've taken it away, where's it gone? We can't do this new one. This is dreadful, please bring it back, and we got all these emails from people in panic, not knowing how to use it, and, and really upset, so um, <coughs> we just had to, you know, persevere and uh, answer the questions, um, explain to people how to use it. We got a huge number of people saying, but I don't know how to search for an ISBN, because of course they were used to the structured indexes that they put your ISBN in here, and that wasn't there anymore. So we, we just kind of answered all these questions and then we just type it in the box, remember Google, and gradually people understood. And um, we do six monthly kind of user satisfaction surveys in the meeting room. And of course the one we did in sort of the, the springtime was, was not good because we had lots of panicky people who didn't approve of the fact that we'd made this change. But by December of that year they were all used to it and they were all happy with it. So. Um, I know I know lots of other people have been through this or have thought about doing it and haven't done it, uh, but I think you do, there is no way of avoiding people throwing up their hands in horror, but you know, you do come through the other side and they do get used to it, so you just have to stick to your guns, I think. So um, we do actually have two implementations of Primo. Um, we made this decision because we um, were developing, um, three or four years ago now, a new uh, cataloging system for our archives and manuscripts collections. And we decided that because of the structure of these um, records, these collections, particularly the hierarchical structure, for those of you who know about archives, um, that it would be better to um, actually provide access to these separately. We are reviewing that decision now and uh, looking at whether we can actually um, integrate the two systems, but at the moment we, we haven't done that. So um, 
as I say, we were developing an in-house system for the cataloging of this material, and um, we had a major data migration from many small um, archival collections into this new system. Um, and the other thing that we are doing currently is to try to provide a, a proper hierarchical view of the data within Primo because at the moment we don't have that and that's something that really people want for looking at archive collections. Um, we worked with what was mainly an internal user panel um, for testing this because they had very specialised requirements. Uh, but we did also consult um, archivists that use our collections. And it is now um, available, it's on our website, um, and it provides access to around 3 million archive manuscript records. And we also switched off the old uh, system for access to archives in 2012, in September. It wasn't quite so dramatic an event, but we still got um, some feedback that people were concerned about um, as changing the system. I think it's fundamentally about change that people really need more happy with. So that's just a, a picture of the, uh, the archives and manuscripts uh, um, search system. I have to say I don't like the title, but that's just chosen by the archives people. So um, this is just kind of looking back um, over the experience of, of implementing Primo. Um, I think that the user experience, as I say, apart from the switch off, which was a bit dramatic. Um, mostly people <coughs> do like uh, Primo, they do like the way it works, and they find the search experience generally good. Um, of course, one thing it provides is access to much more of our collections from one point, uh, which of course we didn't have before. Uh, if you look on our website, you'll see there are still a few other catalogues that we haven't integrated, um, but we are still working through bringing them in and hopefully we will have everything from one point. Um, the users particularly commented they liked the My Workspace element of Primo, um, which was a great deal more flexible and better than the, the previous one that they had. Um, from an internal point of view, the configuration we find is very flexible. We are able to um, do quite a lot of, of things in the back office that, that we really want to do in order to um, display and uh, set up the search for our data. And uh, the, the data loading, as you can see, we uh, or you have seen, we have a lot of different pipes feeding into Primo, um, and that's been a kind of incremental um, improvement in the experience, partly because we've become more experienced at it, but um, I think we have got that going quite well now, so, so that's kind of positive. Um, some of the things that we learned through, through this whole um, process, um, as I mentioned about the kind of project management, um, the idea of this incremental way of doing something, actually putting something live to customers when it's not finished, <laughs> is quite a hard thing for people to get used to, but I think I think they uh, do appreciate why we did that and the, the benefits of doing that now. Um, we have noticed um, that the way Primo shows data does um, expose um, poor data, basically, uh, inconsistencies, for example. Um, <coughs> one of the problems that we have is because we have such a large catalogue, um, which has been created over um, many years, is, uh, is inconsistency, and so records that were created created 20 years ago, <coughs> excuse me, are not the same quality as those created, say, two years ago. Um, <coughs> in particular, in the facets, for example, you see where data is missing, so you'll get uh, languages are particularly notable, one, it'll say, um, if you've got a result set of 100 uh, records, then there are 50 in English, 20 in French, and 5 in other, because there isn't anything in, in the field that indicates what language is. However, the plus side of that is it does enable us to identify those records where there is data missing, and we, we do have a data quality team who are trying to improve our data, so it, it helps them with that. Um, it also shows um, where cataloging practices, which may have been very valid for a kind of older style system, actually don't 
are not helpful in Primo. Um, in particular, I have an issue with um, the fact that we create, <coughs> this is this is British Library's policy, although I understand it is uh, a valid cataloging policy, um, of creating uh, several title <coughs> labels for different formats. This is particularly noticeable in our newspaper collections where we have a title record for the print, a title record for the, the digital, and a title record for the microphone. So when that comes in primo, you see three records, and they're not joined up. So we've had to do work on the system side to join them up so that the customers see one record, and then you decide the format. Uh, but those kinds of things were not, not obvious before. So <coughs> I think we also do need to consider, and, and we do have, I think, processes and systems in place to do this now, but we need to consider the end-to-end -end user experience of Prima, using Prima. So just a little bit about um, some current work that we're doing. Um, one of the big projects that we have at the moment is um, we are opening a new news and media reading room in the British Library at St Pancras. Um, this has been a very long program of work because um, the um, newspaper collections have been kept in a separate building in North London um, since the 1930s and we have had a major program of closing the building, moving all the physical newspapers out, but then looking at setting up um, a new reading room in St Pancras and um, all the support and uh, how we will manage that. And we have, it's, it's called the news and media room because we will also be um, making available, for example, the BBC archives in that reading room. So there will be um, video content and um, all sorts of different content to what we have currently in, in the newspaper library. So that's a major piece of work, and obviously um, the day cell primo is crucial to how we practice <coughs> that. Because one of the big issues for us is we do have print, <coughs> microfilm, and digitised um, collections of newspapers, but they don't really, uh, they're not complete in well, print's probably <coughs> complete, but the digital and the microfilm are not complete. So we have uh, partial coverage of these titles. So we have to be able to inform people of what they can have and in what format. And so we have been working on Primo to try to um, describe that and then make it straightforward so customers know knows if they want a particular newspaper for a particular year, what format do we have and how can they get it. Uh, we have developed a, our ordering system in parallel with this to, um, to try to help <coughs> that. Um, and as I mentioned, we will have the BBC archives available um, on uh, PCs within this reading room and we are looking at more news content um, um, in all sorts of formats so that we make it a more com complete news experience. Another recent development is that um, as part of the changes to the uh, legal deposit laws, we have harvested the whole of the UK web domain um, and we have now completed that exercise and now we are making that available. <coughs> so this is um, available through a separate system, uh, which is a, a solar system, uh, but we obviously want people to be able to access the web archive content from our Explore the British Library in space. So we are now looking at um, joining that up. Um, we, have, we do have what you could roughly describe as title level records harvested into Explore, although uh, because this is from websites, um, the, the quality of those records is variable. Um, but we are now looking at providing a full text search across the web archive data uh, from our reading rooms. Um, a somewhat quirky requirement of the legal changes is that we are only allowed to make this available in our reading rooms and we are only allowed to show the search capability in the reading rooms. So basically if you're at home, you're not allowed to know that you can do full text searching of this. So you're not even allowed to see that there is a button that allows you to search. It has to be invisible outside the reading rooms, which was an interesting challenge. <coughs> 
And we um, we do have uh, we have Primo Central, and we are in the process of setting that up. Um, again, this is for me. This is not a technical <coughs> issue. I think that's straightforward. It's it's understanding the requirements of the various different business areas of the British Library um, and trying to uh, get that balance right, particularly in the communication with our customers, so that we can say. Um, this is content that's available through the British Library, but it's not owned by us, and there are a whole lot of issues around that um, <coughs> from the curators. And also how that is run alongside our document supply service, which does supply um, content, digital content to our customers, but at a price. So we obviously need to be able to distinguish between that that is available for people who want to, to pay for it and that which we can make freely available. So uh, there are things to be discussed about what that looks like for the customers. And I think that's it. So that's just a front page, which I think has been shown today already. So that's it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 